first time my kilt got an introduction separate from me. That's very interesting. Oh, there's a title slide. Ah, okay, so there's a title slide. The title of my talk is, What is Your Fractal Dimension? And so the question is, I guess to start with, what is a fractal? So a fractal is an iterated or repeated e equation or geometric transform at infinite levels of depth. And so it wouldn't be a talk about fractals if I didn't show you pretty pictures. And so there's a pretty picture. How many of you know what that is? OK, volunteers. What is it? Ugh. That's not going to work so well. So this is how I teach. Unfortunately, I don't usually teach in an auditorium, but that's OK. This is an example of the Mandelbrot set. And the Mandelbrot set is effectively a set of equations on complex numbers that generates that lovely curve. We see that lovely curve through the impact of Wolfram Associates and Mathematica. Here's another one, right? Another lovely little curve, right? And this is more about geometric transforms and rotations. This is a fern. But this is all generated electronically. Here's something that's not generated electronically. That's a fractal cauliflower. And it's real. But the point is that each individual piece looks a lot like the other little individual pieces, right? And it's just iterated over a very complex surface. So that is a fractal cauliflower. But fractals are also geometric in nature. And so here's an example of something called a Sierpinski triangle. And so this is a fractal that is done by taking a triangle and then separating it into four internal triangles and cutting out the middle one. We'll come back to another illustration of this. But this is what a Sierpinski triangle looks like in sort of 3D. The web, by the way, is a wonderful place. That fractal cauliflower, I almost had to go to the end of the internet to find that. But not quite. Don't tell my dean. OK, so here are a, bunch, a whole bunch of geometric fractals. Starting from the bottom, the one on the bottom is our friend, the Sierpinski triangle. And now you can really see, right? It's a triangle, then it's a set of nested triangles, then it's a set of nested, nested triangles, right? Everybody got it? OK. The one above it is called a Vixek fractal. And it turns out that does the same thing roughly with squares, right? You take a square, you replace it with five squares, you replace those five squares with five squares, and before you know it, you've got more squares than you can count. That's a lot of squares. The one above that is the Koch snowflake, and that's the one I want to talk about a little bit because I can do that sort of interestingly in the context of this notion of a fractal dimension. So this is where the Koch snowflake starts. That's pretty boring. What is that? Right, this is the audience participation part. Look, you guys are going to have to help me out on this if it's going to work. This is a, it's a line, right? Very good. We've all passed kindergarten. Okay, so that's a line. Now, what you do in the next iteration in order to generate the Koch fractal, you replace that line with that. And so what is the dimension of a line? Right, good. Somebody said it. One, okay. What is the dimension of that? Yeah, all right, okay, so, right, two. But actually, it was funny, because the person who said two did it with a sort of question mark at the end. Like, two? <laughs> yeah, two-ish. Because if you think about it, that line is the same size as the line that you started with, right? Right? It's that size. Right? I could actually hold it. Maybe I can do this. Oh, look at that. The magic of the clicker, right? That line and that line are the same. What did I do? I took the middle third and replaced it by a triangle whose sides are the same as the sides of the things that are left. So if you think about it, right, this has length what? Well, if the original one was length one, but if we subdivide it into three thirds, right, because three thirds is one, good, <laughs> okay, what's the length of this puppy? Four thirds, excellent. <laughs> Somebody in the back is already going, there's a lot of math in this talk. <laughs> All right, hang, hang on, okay. So, four-thirds. So, but if we think about it, right, there's this notion, and if we think about it going further, right, now we replace each side with, you know, it's four-thirds, right, and four-thirds, and so on, and so on, right? How is that measurable, right? It's not a line, right, because it's not dimension one. We know that, but as the person who suggested two with the question mark after it, it's not quite two. It doesn't feel right. So this notion of fractal dimension, or otherwise known as Hausdorff dimension, actually has to do with the length versus the footprint, okay? So the length was four-thirds, right? And the footprint was three-thirds. And so if we think about four over three, right, it's this ratio, right, of length to footprint. Everybody got it? Okay, hang on to that. It turns out that Hausdorff dimension is a little bit more complicated. It uses logs because mathematicians like logs because that keeps them in business. So 
it turns out the log of four over the log of three is, well, that. It's the Hausdorff dimension. It's 1.26. So the person who said two question mark, pretty much spot on. And if you're a computer scientist, what you do is you take it and you do it for a while, right? You iterate that over a bunch of, a bunch of levels, and then you actually do three of them separated by 120 degree turns, and then you've got yourself a little snowflake, which doesn't ever happen in Qatar because it never snows here. <laughs> but that's the Coke snowflake. And its Hausdorff dimension is 1.26. But the point of this introduction was really to talk about this notion of length over footprint. How can you maximize your length over the footprint that you leave. And now I want to talk a little bit about not fractals, but sort of my, my walk to, to this place. So for starters, I grew up in New York City. And I say that only because we've seen New York City in the video, and we've talked about Doha driving, and these are related. I grew up in New York. I learned how to drive in New York. <laughs> I can drive anywhere. What I can't do is cross the street in Doha. <laughs> First of all, because there are no sidewalks. But <laughs> But even if there were, in New York, that's the true sport. Driving, nothing. Crossing a street, now that's exciting. Especially because you're almost always doing it against the light. And so a useful skill that I picked up when I was growing up in New York is telling when the driver of the oncoming vehicle had lifted his foot or her foot off the accelerator. Because now, that's a key piece of information. Because now that foot is equidistant from the brake and the accelerator. And now there's a decision point. <laughs> And as a pedestrian, you exploited the heck out of that. Because <laughs> once you knew they lifted, they were going to break. You knew it. That is a skill that translates to Doha. <laughs> is the guy in the roundabout on the gas, off the gas, right? Is he going to run the red light or not? That's important to know. So that's one thing that actually did translate from my growing up to here. After I grew up in New York City, I went to Carnegie Mellon. And I was at Carnegie Mellon for 30 years which every time I say this now reminds me that that is longer than most of you have been on the planet, which is very distressing. <laughs> but anyway, so I've been at Carnegie Mellon Pittsburgh for 30 years, right? You know? And so this is either a very foolish investment, right, or a guarantee of job security, right? I can't go to Stanford or Berkeley, right? Yep, I'm Carnegie Mellon. So, so now... I've been at my job for 25 of those 30 years running the undergraduate program in computer science, helping, over the course of that time, approximately 2,500 students graduate with degrees in computer science from Carnegie Mellon. And that was a really fun job, because I view myself first and foremost, to go back to Sue's talk, as a teacher. I've known that's what I could do. That's what gets me excited in the morning. It's what gets me excited at night. It's what keeps me at my job till 12 o'clock midnight and getting up again at 6 o'clock the next day. I want to teach. I want to teach people. I'm going to teach people computer science, but I'll teach you anything. I taught you something today about fractals, right? There you go. So I'm a teacher. And so the question, after 25 years, you fall into patterns. And so it was a good time for me to take a step away, and this opportunity presented itself. And what I hoped it would do would be to allow me to determine whether or not the things I thought I knew how to do well were scalable, translatable to a different place and time. And what I've learned, amazingly enough, A, that driving skills in New York translate anywhere, but B, a lot of other things translate too. And I've learned, I've been here now a year and a half, having taught here for a number of other semesters, an awful lot. More than I actually could have bargained for. For one, I learned some Arabic. <laughs> Not nearly enough to know what the students are saying in the back of the class. <laughs> Especially if they're saying it about me. That has to change. <laughs> but more importantly, for example, I learned that I hear Salaam Alaikum a heck of a lot more than I hear Allahu Akbar. And if all you get as an impression of this region from the Western media is the latter, you're sorely mistaken. That is not, that is not what people do. I've also learned that students are students, okay? Now, that's tinged a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a second, but students are trying to figure out who they are and what adults they're starting to become. And parents are parents. Parents know who they are. <laughs> and know exactly what they're going to become, and that's how it is. That's overstating it a little bit. Students are really actually trying to figure out, from the young adults that they are, the adults that they're going to become. And parents, just so you don't think you have a lock on transition here, students, parents are trying to figure out how to move from being the captain of their son or daughter's ship to being a harbor pilot. I often used to talk to orientation parents back at CMU Pittsburgh, and I used to say, you know, the toughest job in the world is being a parent, because you got 18 years to raise a morally right, you know, 
a sentient human being, right, who has a value set that's similar to your own. And then the second hardest job is knowing when you got the first job right and it's time to step away. And so your parents, for all of you who are students, are undergoing that transition, right? How to let you ascend, right? And how to let their influence not disappear, but to decrease, right? They're moving from being captains to harbor pilots. So they're in transition also. And it turns out that actually, that actually does translate from Pittsburgh to Doha. But it has a twist. So, so here we go. So I used to think that I understood all that there was to understand about student, faculty, advisor interactions, right? I graduated 2,500 students. So when a student came to me last year and said, I want to talk to you about my career choices. I said, sure, what do you got? He says, well, I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to take this job in Abu Dhabi or this job in Doha. And so I gave the standard answer to that, which is cool projects, cool people, right? Those are your first two metrics. You want to work on a cool project, you want to work with cool people, and everything else is secondary. And so I said mostly that, and he says, what about death? And I said, what? And he said, yeah, what about death? And I said, okay, that's not part of the lexicon, right? But it was. Because he said, so it turns out if I take the job in Abu Dhabi, then I'm no longer easily able to come back to Qatar under my father's sponsorship, under his aegis. And so now if I go and take this job in Abu Dhabi and it doesn't work out, well, now I have to go home. And home is Syria. And Syria, at least where I come from, means a fairly high probability that I don't see the next day. Okay, 25 years, 2,500 students, nothing prepared me for that part of the conversation. And I won't tell you how the story ends and where he took his job, but I will tell you that it fundamentally changed the way I look at the Syrian conflict. Because before that conversation, Syria was over here, and it didn't have anything to do with me. But now it has something incredibly personal to do with one of my students. And amazingly enough, that does have something to do with me. And so that changed my view of that world in an awful lot of ways. I had a second conversation with a student who shall also remain anonymous. This was when I was teaching a year ago, who looked a little distraught. I said, hey, why don't you come by and chat sometime? And he said, sure. And we started a conversation that pretty much revolved around how to live up to your parents' expectations, which is, again, a conversation I've had a lot of times. But it was couched in the context of his father being in a mosque in Pakistan the week before on Friday at prayers and having a grenade go off in that mosque. Now, his father survived, but wouldn't you know the next week, his father is back in that same mosque for Friday prayers. And this student is tr struggling mightily with trying to figure out, right, here's an example of piety. I don't know if I can live up to that. That is a very different take on the standard student-parent expectation model. And so I've learned a little bit about that, too. And those are amazing takeaways, right? This, again, I thought I knew it all. I know nothing but I'm learning an awful lot from being in this part of the world at this moment in time. One last anecdote, and then I'm, I'm not quite out of stories, but I'm out of stories that are relevant to this conversation. So <laughs> when I was teaching in 2011 in the summer, the end of my class intercepted the beginning of Ramadan. And so I thought, I'm a computer scientist. Let's have a conversation about Ramadan. That's on the syllabus, right? Turned out it doesn't matter. But we did have a conversation around Ramadan. I said, tell me about Ramadan. Tell me about why you do what you do. And as the students talked about this, I said, you know, that sounds an awful lot like Lent, being a Catholic, yet another theme from yet another video. Um, I sort of recognized the themes. And so we talked for about a half hour at the end of class about the similarities and differences between the Catholic tradition of Lent and the Islamic tradition of Ramadan. And it was enlightening. It was enlightening on two fronts. One is I learned out or I learned a lot about Ramadan. But I also learned a lot, amazingly enough, about Lent, because I hadn't had to articulate why the heck we give up things for Lent in an awfully long time. And it made me think about what it is that we're trying to accomplish in that, and how, again, more similar we are than different in our traditions. Yet another, to me, really deep touchstone about what I'm learning here and what I had not learned before in 30 years of work. And so these kinds of opportunities exist everywhere in Education City. We have students from 30 different countries at Carnegie Mellon Qatar, and I'm sure all of your campuses have a similar spread, right? That's five of the seven continents, I'm sure, are touched by the student bodies that are represented. What does that mean? What that means is these opportunities to grow and stretch exist all the time in your environment. 
And it pains me when I walk past groups of students and see GCC students sitting with GCC students and Daisy students with Daisy students and Western students with Western students. No, that's wrong. I mean, not that you should stop being who you are because you can't. But what you should do is find out how more similar these people are to you than different. How more similar we all are to each other than different. That is what Education City should not only be teaching the world, it should also be teaching us. And the way you do that is to burst these little bubbles of similarity that we create around ourselves. And we do that because we're inertial. That's a physics term. It means we are going to follow the path of least resistance. And for all of us, the path of least resistance is to surround ourselves with people who think and act and look and walk and talk just like us. And I'm here to tell you that that's not interesting, if you haven't figured that out already. And it doesn't help you grow. And it doesn't help you think. You think you're most when someone asks you to explain something you think you know about. You learn the most when someone challenges you on something. Not that you're not going to believe that still, but you're going to have to justify it. And justification is much more interesting than knowledge. Now, all of this comes at a price, and I've given up a little bit too, so just for grins. Ah, yes, that's right. Why, you know, why is it? You see a picture of a baby and you go, ah. You know why? Because when they're up at 3 a.m. crying their hearts out, it makes you go get them. Because <laughs> otherwise you go, you're ugly. You go sit there. <laughs> on the left is my wife. And on the right is now my eight-month-old grandson. And they are 8,000 miles away. And not a day goes by that I don't think about them. And the trade-off I made with them being there, especially with the grandson, which wasn't part of my original calculus about coming to Qatar, um, and me being here. And yet, even with them there and me here, it is clearly still worth it because it has stretched me in ways that I cannot imagine. And thankfully, Skype allows me to talk to them at least once a week. And so I'm going to leave you with the following question. Going back to the original way I started this talk, how do you maximize your length versus your footprint? And let me put that a slightly different way. When the time comes, and this is what you think about when you've been on the planet for a little while, when the time comes for somebody to write the fractal journey of your life, do you want it to look like this? Or do you want it to look like this? Or do you want it to look like that? And that is absolutely within your control. Thank you. Shukran.